Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. If you tuned in because you wanted to be calmed down or not alarmed, uh, you probably should log off right now because last week I was kind of alarmed at how alarmed Bill Crystal was alarmed, uh, and now I'm just I know I'm just alarmed <laughs> with what's going on here. I'll be a, I will be honest with you. You look around the the, uh, the where we're at here. My my newsletter headline today is America under siege, and where do you start? The fact that there's going to be the largest armed protest ever to take place on American soil in Washington, D.C., allegedly on uh, January 17th. Uh, it's not just Washington, FBI, saying there'll be protests in all uh, 50 capitals. They're actually boarding up the windows at the state capitol in Madison. The national monuments are closed. Park Service said on Monday they've closed the Washington Monument through January 24th due to continuing threats from the groups that were involved in the pro-Trump riot. The Army Secretary has apparently told a Democratic congressman that at least 25 domestic terrorism cases have been opened and told him that long guns, Molotov cocktails, explosive devices, and zip ties were all recovered as a wide-ranging investigation unfurls. The uh, nation's capital is being flooded with troops. Uh, 15,000 National Guard members could be deployed for the inauguration. House Democrats were briefed on a number of terrifying plots to overthrow the government, including uh, one that uh, apparently is the most concerning would involve insurrectionists forming a perimeter around the Capitol, the White House and the Supreme Court, and then trying to block Democrats from entering the Capitol, perhaps even killing them so that Republicans could take control of the government. Uh, this is from the Huffington Post. And we're just beginning to understand how close we came to catastrophe last week. And our guest today is NBC's Ben Collins, and he was on MSNBC the other day, and and he, and he, he freaked me out. This is what this is what Ben had to say then. I think an important thing to understand here is that there are two different kinds of people at this rally. There were Proud Boys, militiamen, oath keepers who stormed to the front with the idea that they would, you know, wreak havoc, cause violence, maybe arrest, maybe kill some lawmakers. That was the point for those people. Other people, if you're in the QAnon world in that universe, you thought you were going into the Capitol and you were storming it for Donald Trump. You thought you were receiving orders from here from him once you got inside the Capitol. And that's what was happening with a lot of those QAnon people. They were in there waiting for more orders. They, you know, the guy with the zip ties, there were posts for weeks beforehand in the QAnon world about, about arresting these lawmakers and then bringing them to justice on behalf of Donald Trump. And they explicitly talked about zip ties. Um, you know, they, they were makeshift handcuffs for the lawmakers if they got to the right part of the Capitol. I don't think people understand how close we were here. This was close to a mass casualty event involving uh, members of Congress, and uh, it's in it's incredibly dangerous. That's what people are talking about. In QAnon, there's this thing called the Great Awakening. And in the Great Awakening, all of the lawmakers are arrested, rounded up, and executed in a public forum. And that's what this was wow. to a lot of these people. They thought that this was about to happen. Jesus. NBC's Ben Collins uh, joins us. Uh, ben, thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I'm sorry that it came to this, but thank you for having me. You can, bet, you, you can find Ben's work at, uh, at NBC, NBC.com. You, you, you are the chief reporter on the dystopian uh, beat. This is your, your, your beat, dystopia. Yeah, you know, I put that as my bio five years ago when I, on Twitter when I uh, started covering disinformation as a joke, and it is not a joke anymore. It's absolutely the case. No, it's not a joke. And, and I'm so glad we have you on today because I was thinking today that, that, that you know, now it's not like disinformation is part of our politics. Disinformation in the big lie is our politics and has led us to the brink. So I'm just going to throw you the question. I think I know what you're going to say, but how alarmed should we be right now? There were people who thought that it was going to be over after January 6th or assumed that because of the shock of the murder of a police officer that that would be enough. But it's not over at all. How alarmed should we be, Ben Collins? I think we should be pretty alarmed. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be alarmist. That's the thing. Um, and I, I do think that with this level of scrutiny, you can help to thwart um, the attacks in the future. Um, th this was a security failure on, on January 6th for reasons that we're going to have to find out as a country why that took place. Is that a bureaucratic reason? Was it intentional from people involved in the government? We don't know. But uh, now there seems to be some consensus that that should never happen again which is very helpful. Um, my worry, of course, is, you know, this is lonely people who are attracted to these movements, who are attracted to militia movements, to QAnon, 
to magical answers about taking out the top of the government and everything will be fine. And um, those people don't need to coordinate. They just need to have some level of uh, skill with bomb making or weaponry or something. Um, and that's the worry. Those, those people traditionally work as lone wolves by themselves. They don't need marches or rallies. They need themselves. And um, that's in the future. Uh, that that is a, should be a huge focus. But it, there's so many things going around right now about specific rallies and specific threats and targets that I'm worried that even if one of them breaks through, then you know one is too many. What happened last Wednesday didn't surprise you, did it? Because uh, I, I saw that you had been tweeting out and you'd been writing. Um, really, I, I told you before we started the podcast, sometimes I got the sense that you were just trying to you know, yell into the void, grab everybody by the lapels and say, people, you need to understand what's going on here. You need to understand how these QAnon crazy conspiracy theories are infecting everything that is happening right now, the way that the fever swamps are overflowing. So Tell me what what the buzz was. What what was going on on Twitter, on on Parler, on you know, Don, the Donald dot com and everything before this. What did you see coming? So for the month before January sixth, um, there was this feeling, and it was sort of rounded out into a nice sentence that QAnon people would say, which was the military is the only option. They would say this for about a month. They were also urging Donald Trump to cross the Rubicon, which is a Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. Julius Caesar reference to the Rubicon River, um, where it would effectively kick off a civil war, start a dictatorship on behalf of Donald Trump. These were m like known hashtags in the QAnon community, mostly driven by the guy who runs 8Con uh, named Ron Watkins. It's a guy who lives in Japan, uh, runs a site out of the Philippines, and he has been, he probably is Q from QAnon. Um, mm. And he runs... Uh, these disinformation operations with no regard for what happens at the end of them. So this was happening for a month and they realized sooner than other sort of duped people that this wasn't going to end through some sort of electoral college procedure, that this was going to end positively for them through violence or through some sort of civil war. So they were ramping up well before the 6th um, and they were pushing for these rallies and they were talking about violence. They were talking about how the only way to really move forward is to replace the government. Um, so, you know, when I was watching on January 6th, my worry, you know, I called my colleague Brandy Zdrazi, who covers what I cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was watching this and I just called her and we sat in silence on the phone together for about 10 minutes. And uh, I was, I was saying, this is the storm and they don't know it. You know, the storm in the QAnon world is, is the, the mass arrest and ex execution of every Democrat. And I was, I was like, man, we're live streaming. We're about to live stream on television the most grisly event in American history. You thought somebody might be killed. Yeah. I mean, we were really close. Uh, there's that cop, Eugene Goodman, who's mm -hmm. getting uh, – who, there should be a statue for this guy right now. Um, you know, he led these people away from – Congress. He led them away from all the people they wanted to, you know, kidnap and all this stuff. The people brought zip ties to to at least temporarily, um, you know, detain these Congress people, and he led them away from it single handedly. It's one cop. There's a video of it. You can see it. Look him up. It's it's like bravery in the truest sense. Um, and you know, I thought well, that's where we were headed, and I I didn't think anybody really saw like knew that that's where we were headed. These people were very angry and. Look, you know, the QAnon people have, have been waiting for that moment for years. They've been waiting to have their prophecy fulfilled on behalf of the president. And they've been waiting for the president to say this sentence, the storm is coming or the storm is here. Um, uh, and he didn't say it, but they still stormed the Capitol anyway, and they were waiting for orders. And that's really what was going on that day. I, I, I want to get to the moment, but the, the the role of the president. But but as you had pointed out before this event took place, that a lot of the things that Trump and his supporters were saying in public was straight out of QAnon. So they may not have heard the phrase "the storm," but that much of what Republicans were saying about the election, much of the uh, the, the kind of conspiracy theories we heard from the the uh, you know folks like uh, like. Uh, I'm sorry, but you know, Sidney Powell um, was straight from the fever swamps, and in, in in a lot of ways, 
the alt-right had become the mainstream right. The fringes had become what the Republican Party, or at least the Trumpian Republican Party, had become. So, you know, they had to hear their words and ideas echoed from the the White House itself. Is that is that an overstatement? Yeah, you know, a a big missed news cycle here, which was it's fair. We were it was Christmas, but you know, in the the days around Christmas, two prominent QAnon figures were meeting with the president to decide what to do next. Uh, Mike Flynn, who literally took an oath to QAnon, uh, and Sidney Powell, who whose whole thing is the storm and her uh, her whole branding is about the storm. Um, those two people met with the president in the White House in the weeks before January 6th. Um, and Lynn Wood as well, you know, who was filing these insane lawsuits about Stop the Steal. He was talking about how there is secret tape of John Roberts uh, like yeah. performing sexual acts on children and all of this wild, insane stuff, which is just raw QAnon. There's no, there's no way around that. Um, and that sort of thing pervaded in those spaces. It took over lots of parts of pro-Trump blogs all throughout the internet, like the Gateway Pundit, places like that. And that overtook traditional news in that world. And it, it really, it's, that's the scary part to me is that the disconnect from reality got extremely severe over the month and a half after the election because people were running out of legal and realistic options. So the, you know, their talking points became ridiculous. They became complete, complete fantasies. And, and yet, and yet, yeah. you still had most Republicans, at least in the House of Representatives, continuing to refuse to accept the results of the election. I was just looking at a at a, at a, at a piece where Steve Scalise was was on um, one of the cable shows, and and was asked, "Well, will you acknowledge J Joe Biden's win after the Electoral College votes on December fourteenth? And he refused to commit himself. So we still had the 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 bulk of the Republican Party refusing to acknowledge the legitimacy of this election um, up until well e e even after even after um, last Wednesday's storm. Well, yeah, that's the thing that I'll never be able to sort sort of square is that these people were taking the Ted Cruz types were taking relatively intellectual stances on this stuff based on information that was completely bonkers. Um, you know, they were saying like, we can't, like, there's been so much fraud. They were saying that as if this was a commonly accepted fact, but the things that they were referencing were Lynn Wood lawsuits and Sidney Powell right. lawsuits. You know, they, they were referencing QAnon stuff, but they were saying it in such abstract and sort of given notions that um, you didn't even need to know if these people were into QAnon. It didn't matter. It sort of got subsumed into the talking points of the Republican Party, despite them being QAnon based theories and facts. They weren't branded that way, so they didn't have to say it. But the information was, you know, conspiratorial and from 8Con and from 4chan. This is such a huge point, Ben, is, is that when you had people like, for example, uh, my home state senator, you know, Ron Johnson saying, well, we're just asking questions because we have millions of people who, who you know, have doubts about the election. What they were doing is basically saying because there had been so much, so many lies out there, so much disinformation, so many Q sponsored or Q tainted or Q adjacent conspiracy theories out there that now we have to take them seriously and do something about it. So there, there was a, even though it's kind of laundered through some of their, their rhetoric that's the through line isn't it of everything yeah. that's happened yeah I, I mean years ago i you know I, I jokingly called it the human centipede of bad information there was this <laughs> way stuff would get from 4chan to fox news and the president within a day because it would get laundered right you know in at no place down that chain was somebody really breaking ranks or breaking some sort of editorial line so basically what it would do is you'd start a rumor on 4chan uh it would be an anonymous poster on 4chan just saying, you know, I hear this thing is happening. That thing would get aggregated to Reddit. And then, you know, InfoWars would take something from Reddit, but not 4chan. So it would go to InfoWars. And then from InfoWars, the guy at the Gateway Pundit would say, okay, it's on InfoWars. It might be true. Then since it's on the Gateway Pundit, some uh, an aggregator, like back in the day, Drudge would take it and explode that. Ooh, then it would yeah. go super viral on Twitter. Then the president would see it or Fox would see it. And they would say- And Talk, ra well, talk Radio would pick talk it up. Radio. And they would say, I don't know where, you know, I don't know if this is true, but we're here in this thing. Mm -hmm. And then it would sort of like have a feedback loop where the guy on 4chan who made this up would be like, I don't know, am I onto something? The president just said the thing that I made up six hours ago. So maybe I'm onto something. Maybe we need to keep diving on this. And then eventually it sort of creates a reality of its own 
even though it was created in a basement a day ago. Oh, my God. So going back to your point about how close we were to a mass casualty event, and you were talking about the, the, the security guard who led the protesters away from the Senate door, it, 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 it seems obvious to me, though, how close they came to not just committing acts of violence, but to succeeding in derailing the whole presidential election process. So, for example, if they had broken in and 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 taken some senators hostage, or taken a state rep- a, a House of Representative member uh, hostage, or killed anyone, or, or even just you know held them prisoner, it seems extremely unlikely that 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 the Congress would have been able to go ahead with the vote and the certification. They could have. They came very close to delaying, derailing the entire constitutional process. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. And that's why that's why they did what they did. They found the loophole, which was violence. And that that's the scary part is they knew that this is the end game. Um, they, look, I know everyone focuses on the QAnon shaman, the guy with the horns in the pelt. Right. And everyone's like, oh, look at how silly this is. These people were these people were unserious. And yeah, there were some unserious people there It actually served as very good cover for the rest of them. Because there were people there who knew exactly what they were doing, who were wearing fatigues, had walkie-talkies, um, you know, busted through mm. with very specific instruments that they knew could get um, through lines of defense. And they were working together. And, you know, the, the people around them, there was a cacophony of insane people who uh, are very, like I said, very silly people. Uh, but those people got wrapped up in it, too. Because once you think, you know, you've been told this whole time that, that the government was going to be overthrown on behalf of Donald Trump. Um, although you may have been silly about it previously, once you're in the middle of it, you're in the middle of it. You know, <laughs> once you're, you, you drew a hard line once you entered that capital. So you were serving as sort of an infantry to these pretty right. skilled militiamen who had busted through with the intent of doing this precise thing, which was at least delaying the election and maybe overturning it. We, we we got a glimpse of how dangerous it could be when the, there were the arrests of the, what was it, nearly a dozen men involved in the plot to kidnap uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, maybe kidnap and, and, and murder her. And the, these guys may have been crazy, but they were serious. They were very serious. And yet it seems as if we as a country didn't really internalize the nature of the threat. It didn't cause anyone to lower the temperature or to be more careful about the rhetoric. I mean, that should have been one of the big warnings. And then of course, you have Gabriel Sterling in Georgia come out and say, Mr. President, you need to stop saying these things. Someone will get killed. Someone is going to get shot. And yet nothing happened. There was no reaction to it. Well, Charlie, I mean, I, I want to know from you, because the way I reacted to the Whitmer thing, when all of that stuff came out after the fact, where they, you know, first we, we heard of, we heard that there was a plan generally, and then we heard that there was a plan specifically to kidnap the governor and to, mm-hmm. I, I, it's still unclear what the game plan was after that. But my, you know, Charlie, f- did you think that was hilarious? Because I thought it was funny no. at the time. There, Okay. Okay. Interesting. Not at all. I thought like, I thought. Like, what did they think they were going to do? Were they going to become the governor themselves? Like, what was the next step, right? So I think a lot of people thought that was just, a, mm-hmm. you know, a funny outcome that these people thought they could personally overturn a state government. So I think that's why people didn't take that seriously. Um, and, you know, mm-hmm. you see the mugshots of these people. They are not, uh, they didn't look like geniuses that could overthrow a government, right? And I think right. that that's what this was, is that, you know, people view this as podunk or not, you know, you know, people who cannot uh, pull off a genuine insurgency. But when you have these kinds of numbers and when you have people who are trained in this stuff and you, you use that as a test run, eventually it's not it's not on well, at all. It's very serious. And, and there are, and they have guns and it doesn't take a lot yeah. of guys with guns to do very bad things. OK, so let's go back to the whole question of the incitement, because uh, in, 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 in President Trump's role, um, I personally, tell me whether you disagree, I personally think it's a mistake to focus just on his remarks on Wednesday right before the event. I mean, clearly he was egging them on. Clearly he wanted them to go. Clearly he was targeting Mike Pence. But um, there's this larger pattern of that you've described of the incitement, the the spreading of of the big lie, the ginning up of anger and, you know, sense of conspiracy theory. So give me your sense on what was the president's role about what happened la- in what happened last Wednesday and what is happening right now with the sort of the country on edge wondering, is there going to be a violence? You know, January 6th was the date circled for him to take back the election. 
Yeah. And in the days before, you know, there, there, it wasn't clear even what he was saying or what he was talking about, even to the people showing up. The, the people who showed up to that rally didn't know what was going to happen. They thought that there was going to be, uh, you know, if you watch the people in, in on those extremist forums, as the speech was going on, they were like, this guy's talking about Oprah. Like, I thought he was going to have the goods about overturning the election. What's going on? So they genuinely thought that he was going to have the goods. They sincerely believed that he was going to do a dump of this 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 amazing evidence. Yeah, and why wouldn't they? Because he had kept saying, see you on January 6th, both on Twitter and his speeches. In fact, the Wi-Fi password for the press at his event in Georgia, where he was campaigning for Purdue and, and Leffler, the Wi-Fi password was see you January 6th with an exclamation point at the end of it. Hmm. So this was a weeks long uh, propaganda campaign to say that you know something was going to happen on the six. That's the other thing too. If he had left and they didn't mar- storm the Capitol, what a letdown for those people, right? Those people flew all throughout the country because he said something was going to happen on January sixth, and you know he gave the only marching orders in that speech were go march in the Capitol. The hmm. only orders that he had was that, and hmm. it's not, like as these people were not going to just go march in the Capitol and just stay there on the outside and just yell at them. That wouldn't have accomplished a thing other than intimidation. So he had built this up as some sort of, you know, earth shattering event. So have people all throughout that ecosystem. You know, Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA said he bust in 80 different uh, buses of people and that today was going to be one of the most consequential days in American history. That was the sort of talk. They were talking about it as uh, 1776, one of the largest uh, hashtags on Twitter the night before was uh, 1776. If you go by the numbers, that's from numbers from the Network Contagion Research Institute. It was 1776 was the, one of the biggest hashtags in the, the MAGA ecosystem the night before. These people thought they were doing the revolution. That's what in, they thought in, was in, yeah, Okay. In, in, in their ecosystem, what does 77, 1776 mean? D- does it mean revolution? Does it mean violent revolution? It, it means what you want it to mean. That plausible deniability is the heart of mm-hmm. this entire day, this entire ecosystem. You know, you, you can take it to mean that the storm is coming, which would absolutely suffice for revolution, right? If you're, you know, beheading uh, Democrats en masse on public television. Um, but you can also take it to mean something symbolic. And that's how you get, you know, teachers and CEOs and, you know, regular members of society flying across the country to go to this rally as, as a last stand. These people are doing a symbolic last stand and they got caught up in a genuine insurrection. Okay. In the category of what, how alarmed should we be? Um, there's at least anecdotal information about members of the secret service of the military, of the Capitol police who were sympathetic with, if not accomplices to what happened. So right now, how concerned should we be? about QAnon friendly folks in the National Guard, in the U.S. Army, in the Secret Service, in these other security forces? Um, you know, I, my worry is that there are just more of these people than we think or can know. Um, during the pandemic, we saw so many groups of people fall down that specific rabbit hole, uh, in part because QAnon supporters were so rabid in their evangelism during that time. And nobody else was rabid in their evangelism. Everyone else was freaked out and there was no plan and the world was falling apart, right? And in the QAnon world, it wasn't. In the QAnon world, everything was going to plan, right? Um, they, you know, they were saying, hey, don't worry about this. This is the pandemic. First of all, it's not that real. It's a new world order thing. But yeah. second of all, you can get your life back very quickly. Like you can go hug your grandparents and not feel bad about it because not only is the pandemic not real, but Donald Trump has it all in hand. It's all fine. He's taking out, all of the bad guys, all of the evil guys for us. So it, th- that recruitment on social media, both in pro-Trump forums, but also in wellness spaces, in uh, healing groups on Facebook and Instagram, um, it recruited more Trump supporters from disparate alternative lifestyles into that space. So it's not just cops and secret service and you know gruff pro-Trump dudes. It's all levels of society. 
And I think we got to figure out where those people came from and how many there are. I, I, we really don't know. The polling on this is all over the place. Mm. It could be, you know, the, the low estimates are in the high hundred thousands. The high estimates are in the you know tens of millions. We got to figure out how many people really believe in this stuff. I'm not saying I don't know what the next plan is in terms of like getting these people out of that mindset. But we have, we have to first quantify this and see how many are serious about the violent parts of it. And then we can work backwards from there. So what was the reaction in this world to what happened on Wednesday? Um, were people horrified? Were they energized? Did they think that this was the, you know, the first shots of 1776? Uh, what, what, what was the reaction that you got in the first few days after this happened? Um, there, there were several reactions. Um, the, I think the only positive thing that came out of this is that people who were um, just pro-Trump for regular reasons, you know, taxes or something like that, mm -hmm. that, that was the last straw for a lot of people. I do. I really do believe that. And I've seen that um, in my life. I've seen it around mm -hmm. me. Um, but in the extremist world, there were two reactions. One, it was, you know, this was Antifa. This was a staged op. Mm -hmm. uh, this was all done on a green screen, you know, standard Infowars stuff that issues responsibility for the idea that this, that, you know, years of violent talk uh, could lead to violent action. Um, so honestly, that is a healthier response than the other response, because that response makes it so you are against violence and you couldn't possibly be a part of a movement that um, killed a cop. The other response is the scary part where militias and people who are more committed to taking down the government than they are committed to Donald Trump uh, were upset that it wasn't successful. Um, in fact, a lot of the people after the uh, middle of the night Donald Trump video where he effectively concedes, mm -hmm. um, those people were like, okay, so Donald Trump isn't the guy. You know, he, he wasn't the guy standing up for us all along. It's We're on our own now. Um, so they were disillusioned. They felt betrayed by him. They felt betrayed by Donald Trump. And th those are the people on websites like 4chan and the Donald.win where they're, you know, they are still planning for the future. Those are the people who are behind this million militia march uh, in, in these other scary big events in the future who believe that you know, the government is, again, it's run to them by, at the very least, criminals at, you know, at the worst child eaters. And they just need to be taken down at all costs. And uh, that's that's the split right now. You get the you get the people who don't believe it could be them, and they're say, they're coming up with ludicrous excuses to to deflect blame, or people who have quadrupled down and don't even need the leader of their movement anymore. Well, well, well talk to me also about the relationship with uh, with police officers and, uh, and and law enforcement. This was a movement that uh, through much of the summer was all about law and order, backing the blue, uh, blue lives matter, um, and then of course we have the event where a police officer is murdered. How do, how does that tension work? How does it how does it play out? Are there good cops and bad cops? And you want us, you know, if you're a good cop, you're going to join us. If you're not a good cop, we're going to shoot you. What? I mean, how does it work? It's extraordinarily complicated. I would say it's nuanced, but there's not like, you know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really actually make sense. The internal logic doesn't make sense. So there were the, a big part of this movement is the Boogaloo movement, which is inherently anti-cop because they're anti-state. Um, and those people have been sort of driving the ship in the extremist side for a while now. Those people just hate cops. They've, they've always hated mm. cops. Um, you know, they go into Black Lives Matter protests and they try to, they try to blow stuff up um, because the, the point is to end the state. And they target specific, they, car, they target what they call alphabet boys, which is like the ATF, the FBI. They, they target plain clothes cops too. Those people were in that rally as well. Um, they are... They are an outsized part of this movement, despite being the antithesis of the rest of the movement. You know, um, but a lot of a lot of people have become anti-cop since this happened because of Ashley Babbitt, who was the QAnon mm -hmm. supporter who was shot trying to break through a door that would have led her directly to Congress people and Mike Pence. And they they have martyred this person just straight up, and because of that, the person who shot them was a cop, and it has radicalized them against cops since then. Because hmm. they, because they believe, you know, the cops could be part of this deep state now, right? The, they, they can fold that pretty neatly. They can fold the Secret Service very neatly, 
into a deep state conspiracy theory. So that that's what's going on there. So s- since all this happened, um, we've had some dramatic developments on social media. Twitter actually bans Donald Trump, which is amazing. Um, in the last couple of days, they at least what, what I've read is that they've eliminated about 70,000 accounts that were linked to QAnon. And of course, now Parler's been shut down. So f- f- first of all, what took social media so long to realize that this stuff was potentially dangerous? This, we've been debating this. We've been talking about this. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, a lot of people thought that Twitter would never, ever, ever ban the president of the United States, but they did. So what took so long? Uh, they, they knew this, something like this could happen. Uh, I've talked to people at Twitter and Facebook and Instagram for years. Um, they, they, they realized that this was a possibility and I don't know why it took this long specifically for this to be the final straw. Um, they, they always work. They never work preventatively. They always work on yeah, the last battle. Yeah. Uh, so but it, at least yeah. this time they are, you know, they, they, they took a drama- they took a hammer instead of a scalpel this time, and it has clearly made a difference. Okay, I want to get to that whether it's made a difference or not. I mean, obviously on the right, you're getting a lot of uh, you know victim playing, which is that this is an attack on free speech. This is an attack on the First Amendment. It's not the First Amendment because it's not state action. But what was going on um, between Wednesday and the time when everybody decided to shut down Parler? Now, for people who don't, aren't aware of this, Parler is sort of the the, the right wing. Um, you know, right wing version of, of of Twitter where they had no standards, no moderation really whatsoever, and where a lot of right wing uh, folks went because they thought they were going to be censored on Twitter. So, but but Parler um, Parler was sort of the, uh, the the back alley of social media there for a while, wasn't it? I mean, there's worse that. But what what were you seeing on Parler that led the other media companies to basically kill them at least for now? Uh, so there are two things at play here: um, the content side and sort of how things work in terms of moderation decisions. So the content side with Parler, uh, the site had devolved into sort of an aggregator for the dumbest stuff on 4chan mm-hmm. and the Donald.win in a way that served itself as a feed instead of just, you know, just a laundry list of conspiracy theories like it is on 4chan. So it was, basically it normified um, all of the wildest conspiracy theories that were going on in the days after uh, January 6th. So that's why it became so dangerous, I think, is that it was getting to a much wider audience, conspiracy theories that were otherwise relegated strictly to 4chan. Um, But in terms of why it happened then, uh, I I will say that in the days after January 6th, I'd never seen that kind of internal pressure at places like Twitter to take this down. There were, you know, I was leaked internal Slack messages by people at Twitter. And there were a lot of people saying like, look, I, I was, I was in the camp of he's the president. We can't take down his account. He deserves to have an account for years. And they said, uh, the quote was, uh, I think fomenting a coup is a bright line to draw. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that, so. and, and I think that, and I think killing people. So, yeah. And killing people. So, uh, by Friday, there was this massive meeting at Twitter where they said, look, I, it's hard to work here. Uh, where this guy is using our platform as a weapon. Um, we don't have to do this. We got to get him off. And by the end of the day, uh, Donald Trump's account was gone. And then what happens in that space is that there's sort of a cascade. Uh, you know, people sort of follow each other's leads here. You know, Twitter always follows Facebook or Facebook follows Twitter. And then Amazon followed those people, uh, which would at that point, Apple, Google, Twitter, and Facebook in, in trying to get Parler offline. And, and yeah, and Parler is completely offline, at least for now, until they find some different servers. Um, one of the leading f- uh, figures in, in in Parler is Dan Bongino, who is one of the uh, the crackpot, does he a talk radio host, uh, occasional commentator on Fox. Th- this is this is uh, Dan Bongino um, complaining um, and or whining about what happened to Parler uh, the other day on Fox understand we were wiped out listen to me america we were wiped out i've been texting with brian all weekend and what did brian what did you say every text was like apple question mark yep apple then brian would text me google too yep brian google then he texts me next amazon too yep 
That was my answer to him every time. I have not slept all weekend. They've effectively tried to bankrupt me and my investors on Parler. And you know what? They won. And to all the geniuses out there, too, saying, oh, this is a private company. It's not a First Amendment fight. Really? It's not? Read the Wall Street Journal op-ed today about Marsh versus Alabama, where a so-called private town tried right. to restrict access to religious materials and lost because they were a de facto government. You know what? These companies are more powerful than a de facto government. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, well, wh whatever. So this is what confuses me a little bit, Ben. Um, tr Trump and a lot of folks on the right want to get rid of Section 230. 230 basically says we're not going to hold you accountable for anything that's on your site, right? I mean, it gives yeah. you, you know, it, it, mean, it means you can't be sued for somebody who says something libelous, slanderous, or 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 or, or whatever. Um, in fact, if you did do that, that would shut them down even faster, wouldn't it? I mean, oh yeah, they, they would have been I, gone. All of these yeah. people would have been gone a long time ago. In part because yeah. if two thirty is gone, if you can if you can sue Twitter for what's posted on their platform, there's actually more incentive to do it, right? So yeah. you know, say uh, you know, MAGA Patriot four twenty or whatever tries like says something libelous about me, um, that I eat kids or something, right? Yeah, I could sue that guy, but um, you know, getting that guy's Ford F one fifty is not really high on my priority list of like the the things that I I want to get in my life, spend my life doing, suing a man, getting all these legal fees. But if I can sue you know MAGA Patriot four twenty and Twitter uh, for propagating this thing that got you know forty thousand retweets then i uh then i win like i i would definitely That's win that fight. it's the yeah. mother load right so twitter in that case is disincentivized from even hosting that account ever so that guy is no longer on the platform it's, it doesn't make any sense for twitter to host somebody like donald trump who consistently spews libelous stuff about all of his political enemies so i'm not sure he understood that no he he didn't and i think it was it would have made the lives of people at Twitter and Facebook harder, which may, which is he was probably what he was told, and he probably yeah. wanted to get some vengeance there. But it would have made his life impossible. Um, yeah. It would have put him in this exact position that he's in right now, but two or three years ago. Well, I, I want to get to that in a moment. So the anger, though, is building out there. There's no question about it um, that, that, that has not gone away. So the latest talking point that we're getting from Republicans is that, OK, uh, yes, we have, uh, you know, fueled these conspiracy theories. Uh, yes, we've either propagated these big lies. Uh, many of us voted to actually overturn the election. Some of us signed on to a completely mendacious lawsuit that would have uh, that would have reversed the election. But now it's time to heal. And if you go ahead with impeachment, well, um, you know, there might be violence and you're sort of getting this. This is Brian Kilmeade from from Fox essentially saying it's crazy to go ahead with impeachment because people out there are having these protests and there could be blood. Brian Kilmeade. We believe that America could be more effective and has been ineffective because we've been at each other's throats. What could be more disenchanting? They don't want him to, to run nice? again. They right. don't want him to run again. They don't want him to run again. That's fine. But you don't understand, too. There's a lot of people that want him to, number one, continue to be a force in the Republican Party, believe a lot what he believes. He has 75 million supporters. So if you have an overarching sense that I got to bring the country together because we see what's happening around this country, how 50 state houses are being threatened on Inauguration Day. This is the last thing you want to do. It astounds me right. that now Chuck Schumer, guys, is exploring a possible workaround using the authority granted to two senators back in 2004 to reconvene the Senate in times of emergency, I assume this, and have a quick impeachment vote. Fantastic idea. Mitch McConnell has to sign off on it, but it would be right. as dumb as Nancy Pelosi hopping on 60 Minutes last night and saying the, the president's an imminent threat well, that's and not he has to happen. be derailed. Mitch McConnell said I okay, so that, that kind of sounds like a threat, or at least the, the implication being there. You don't want to do this because you'll make us mad now and that there might be more violence. Yeah, the whiplash, if you're watching this <laughs> network, must be so profound. Last week, yeah. you were told that Antifa did it and we must bring them all to justice and all of them. And then you know, two days later, we're like, okay, we got to bring country together to heal. We can't just forget about all the stuff we did the last month and a half in this network. We we must come together as one country and move past this for the next you know nine ten days. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know how you square the circle. In fact, I really I would like to talk to somebody who watched Fox and, and and see if they if they watched it every day, see if they feel a little betrayed because um, everything they were told they, they were told like four or five different stories on four or five different days. 
now we're at this, we must come together and heal thing. It seems like they're settling on this as a, as an idea. Um, look, it's, it's up, it's up to Democrats. If they want to impeach this guy, but you know, the, the narrative is not clear yet. Like <laughs> the narrative about why he shouldn't be impeached. I, I still haven't heard why that is yet. Well, and, but, but you are getting these reports of the congressman saying that the level of anger and threats is actually rising, that there is clearly an intent to intimidate. So here's the basic question that I really wanted to get to all along. So it does feel like we've had this moment of reckoning now. We realize what the stakes are. We realize what the threat is. Uh, we have Twitter shutting down the president and many of the QAnon folks. We have Parler being shut down. Uh, we have Cumulus Radio, which owns a bunch of uh, conservative uh, talk radio uh, stations and uh, you know employs people like Mark Levin and Dan Bongino saying, you got to stop lying about the election. So I guess the question is, does this actually make a difference, Ben? Or does this simply shove the fever swamp into different shadows? Does this does this actually change the media ecosystem in a meaningful way? It's a really good question. Um, it really relies on how good and persistent people are at finding the lies that they want to be fed. I yeah. do think that over the last five years, 10 years really on social media, the lie was the thing that was the easiest thing to find. You would be fed that and it would feel the best, by the way. You would be fed mm -hmm. that on Facebook through an algorithm that you didn't even know you were a part of. And you would you would get this lie that would make you feel great instantly. You know, Why does the right. lie feel better? Why do you get more dopamine hits out of lies than out of truth? Sure. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, there, there's, there's two major reasons. One, uh, you know, fear is an exciting prospect. You know, <laughs> the idea that there is a that there is a group of bad guys that are out there personally bringing you down and that they can be defeated. That's, that's a movie, you know, it's that, drama. That fear, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. And it, it enraptures you. And that's, uh, that's what happened with QAnon. Basically. It's like, there's an end game. There's a, there's the end of the movie. And when you saw people in the Capitol waiting around, milling about waiting for instructions from the president, you know, they were waiting for the next scene in the movie. They just didn't know that they were in the movie. <laughs> They, okay, they were so, characters in the movie now. Yeah. So if if the lies are the dopamine hit, it, it's sort of like lies as as crack or as, as as drug. And so the question is, does this make a difference? And and the, and it really does depend on on how much people want to go get their next hit, right? And and the, there are still sites out there that where they can get the stuff, right? Yeah, and I, I think that's really the First Amendment uh, thing that makes sense here. You can find it. It's not hard. Um, you know, Parler is complaining about being banished from the internet. They, there actually are hosting providers that will take them on, like mm -hmm. Epic, which hosts Gab, um, Vanwatech, which hosts all all manner of terrible uh, websites. Uh, people will be able to find that. It'll just be harder for them to get to it. Like that's that's just the case. Um, that, and that's the way speech used to work before we had Facebook right. and Twitter, where everyone had this one hundred percent level playing field. That really wasn't hundred percent level playing field. It was really sort of like tilted towards fear and paranoia. So, so, so yeah. yeah, once once they're not mainlining it anymore, maybe maybe you know, there's this thing called exogenous shock where if you're kind of like removed from your environment, um, you can kind of see better what you were taking in. Regardless, that could be information, that could be food, that could be all sorts of things. Um, maybe those people can go through that shock and be like, oh, wait a minute, was that really healthy? I was sitting on Facebook all day just thinking about Hillary Clinton. Was that really? A good way to spend my life. We might go through that in the next few months. I would hope that that's the case because there's two alternatives that I can see is is that what you've done is you've shoved these, you know, the, the, you've shoved the disinformation and the conspiracy there is over to the fringes so that you have, you, you have, you've, you've isolated them. That would be the best case scenario. The other un unfortunate option is that the fringes then get a much bigger audience and become more like a mainstream so that, 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 that in fact, um, rather than killing off those folks, what happens is that you wake up uh, six months from now and OAN has higher ratings than Fox News or Newsmax or something. I mean, the Newsmax is out there and that, that Gab has become the new Twitter. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen, do we? No, we don't. That's that, that's the worry is, you know, if these people build the infrastructure that is parallel, um, that could be that could be very dangerous. But it takes lots of time and money and effort and uh, those those parallel infrastructures, if like, for example, if Section 230 is repealed in that environment, 
there are a lot of problems for somebody trying to build a parallel infrastructure there. Um, so, you know, it's possible that could happen, but really this is something that even law enforcement, like the FBI has been thinking about for a long time with other kinds of extremist groups. This is when you talk about ISIS, this is what you talk about when you talk about deplatforming and all this stuff. There were people in the FBI who thought, you know, maybe we should leave the ISIS propaganda. Maybe we should allow them to post in these sites where we know where they are. And we know the mm -hmm. people being recruited there. It's the whole, there, there are two minds here. Um, do you let people propagate this stuff and allow your, allow law enforcement to track these people, um, see yeah, it all in the open, understand what's going on, or do you pen them in, allow them to like, you know, live in this space where everything is wrong. The entire thing is violent. The entire thing is toxic and people are rooting each other on to commit terror attacks. And while that group is smaller, it's much harder to track and it's much harder to diffuse. Right now we're moving towards the second thing. We'll see what's better now. I think, I mean, we're, we're about to see what's going to happen. So the president today, while you and I are speaking, is headed off to Alamo, Texas, not the Alamo, but Alamo, <laughs> Texas, on the, on, the, on the border where he's going to be touting his wall, um, the great wall that Mexico didn't pay for. So th there's, I've seen a lot of speculation online that people are going to, that these folks we've been talking about are going to read that, see the president at the Alamo or at Alamo, Texas, and that that is kind of a signal to them in some way. So give me your take on that. President of the United States yeah. Yeah. in Alamo. I mean, the people who are looking in s symbolism and everything, including mm -hmm. you know, misspelled tweets and stuff, this is a gold mine, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so. Cue on people like read into the read into typos in his tweets and say like, if you replace this letter with this thing, that means he's secretly doing this. Um, you know, the Alamo or Alamo, Texas, is you know a very direct reference to a last name. So. Um, that's going to happen regardless. Um, you know, do you I think hope it's real? Do you, think, yeah. do, you, do you think that that's one of the reasons why he's there? I mean, I, I don't want to get in. Yeah, of no, <laughs> you do. I see. I, I, I'm questioning myself going, okay, am I spending too much time looking at this stuff? Am I thinking like this, that I'm going, damn, the president is going down to Alamo now with everything going on. That, I mean, we are, we are all subject to this conspiracy thinking. Yesterday there was a, there was this rumor going on, going around the internet that the sec the Secretary of State's website showed that President <laughs> Trump was uh, was removed from office on that day, and nobody yeah. knew about it, and they were announcing it secretly on the Secretary of State's website. And my brain was like, "Well, it's there. Um, how do you explain this?" And I did the whole thing, and I, I texted one of my colleagues. I was like, "I don't know. Is this happening?" And then five minutes later, I was like, "Never mind. I have QAnon brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happened." I've exactly. Been, I think like these people know. Yeah, yeah you, you, you can marinate in it. Well, I think that the, the the one thing that's pretty obvious or should be obvious to folks is that it was not going to be over on January 6th. It's not going to be over uh, on January 20th. We are in for a a cycle of this. And um, I'm not sure that most people are prepared for what's going on. I don't, again, we don't want to be alarmist, but I will admit right. that I, I'm alarmed at the number of people that have gotten drawn into this. And, and, and I, will, I will say this, that you, you have the crazies, you have the conspiracy theorists. I'm also just disturbed about the, the sincere, I mean, people who are not nuts, who somehow honestly in their minds believe the lies they have been told, believe that this election was stolen, believe that the American democracy is at risk. Because at that point, it's understandable, it's, it's almost rational and defensible for them to try to take action to get it back so that it's not the culpability is not on them as much as on the people who have misled them. And there have been so many people who have been so willing to mislead them. And I, I think there will be tens of millions of people for the next 20 years who will believe that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's my worry, too. I, w I want everybody to go to a this is the terrible advice generally, but I want people to go to a subreddit called QAnon Casualties. Ooh, and yeah. it will show you. Um, you know, for every person that stormed the Capitol, there are hundreds or if not thousands of families that have just been torn apart by this stuff. And it's because they are not living in reality and they're cutting people off. It's how cults work. Um, it's how abusive relationships work. You know, they, people who have, there was, there was a story last night about a kid who, uh, you know, who, who told his school he had COVID so he couldn't come in and his mom, uh, tried to kick him out of the house because he was like, she was like, the government is going to come and take us now. Mm. And we are living in this constant state 
of mass paranoia now, in part because it's been sort of in the back of our psyche for years. There's a man on Twitter who can take over our thoughts in any moment with wild conspiracy theories and uh, streams of paranoia. And that has an effect on the populace. Um, and so does all of these all of these tiny little other conspiracy theories that popped up over the course of the last four or five years. Um, you know, there are violent ends to this stuff, but there are also very human heartbreaks that come with it too. Um, we're going to have to, as a country, come together and try to figure out how to fix this through psychology and through um, just humanity and empathy. And that's going to be the challenge in the next few years. How long can you keep doing this? Do you know what I mean by this? Yeah. I mean, how, how long can you every single day read this stuff, know this stuff, spend the time marinating in the crazy? I mean, Ben, you know, you're a young guy, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, don't, don't you every once in a while have this thing like, I'm, you know what, if I have to do this another six months, I'm going to lose my freaking mind. <laughs> oh, I say it every day. Okay. Um, but I said that I said that 18 months ago. So maybe I'm just post that, that level. I don't know. Um, no, I mean, like the, the thing is, like you see a lot of humanity in here. Um, you, you see a lot of people just begging for meaning and like longing for relationship and love. It's really at the end of the day, that's all this is about. Um, people get a people get a huge um, feeling of identity sometimes for the first time in their life from feeling this stuff. Um, that's and, why it's so powerful. Yeah, and at this point, and I'm sure I get it too, just from trying to report on this stuff so, to help those people who are who've had their family taken in by this stuff. Um, so look, it, we're in the middle of, this is like a, you know, it's become a calling for a lot of people who ha have had family members go down this path um, because they want them back in their lives and they see that it's happening at an exponential rate from now on. So yeah, it's depressing as hell, man. I'm, I'm extremely tired and very sad all the time, but um, you, you can, if you want to be one of the people who provides the light right now, um, you can do it. There's, there is a way to help. And we're going to, um, we're going to be on the front lines of something that, that can provide a, a really nice empathetic solution for a lot of these people in the future. All right. That's a, that's a good note to end on Ben Collins from NBC news. You can find his work on NBC news.com. Is it NBC.com? NBC news.com? NBC news.com. I think it's probably best. Yeah. NBC news.com. See him on, on the air. I really appreciate your work has been just fascinating, uh, disturbing, but really fascinating if you want to find out what's going on. Uh, ben, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again. <laughs>